morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sergio Menuzzi. I am a professor of linguistics and Portuguese at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre. And I'll be the moderator of the conference you will follow this morning at Abralinha ao Vivo. Abralinha ao Vivo, Linguists Online, is an event organized by Abralin, the Brazilian Association of Linguistics, in cooperation with various international societies, among which uh, Le Comité Internacional Permanent de Linguistes, uh, La Associación, Associación de, Linguist, de Linguística y Filología de América Latina, a Sociedade Argentina de Estudios Linguísticos, a Sociedade Española de Linguística, the Linguistic Society of America, uh, the Linguistics Association of Great Britain, the Australian Linguistic Society, and the British Association for Applied Linguistics. You can, you can follow uh, the full program of Abralinha ao Vivo, visiting the events page on the Instagram. Today we will have as a guest, uh, Professor Karen Laus. She will present a talk entitled Word Order in French, Spanish and Italian Syntax, Information Structure and uh, Grammaticalization. Karen Laus is Associate Professor in the Department of Linguistics at the Catholic University of Leuven, uh, Belgium, where she leads the uh, research group called Functional and Cognitive Linguistics grammar and typology. After her PhD at, uh, at, school, uh, at the Catholic University of uh, Leuven and Paris Suite, she was a visiting fellow at different centers, including uh, Santa, uh, uh, the center in Santa Cruz, uh, California, and the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. She pursued several research areas, in, uh, which include the comparative study of romance syntax, the study of information structure of the sentence uh, and the study of non-canonical sentence structures like uh, uh, cleft sentences. Uh, many of uh, her recent articles are dedicated to cleft, cleft sentences and many uh, previous uh, articles were directed to uh, constructions involving uh, post-verbal subjects in French. Actually, uh, about post-verbal subjects, she wrote a book entitled Campas le Cigogne, the nominal post-verbal subject in, French, in modern French, which is from uh, 2011. Well, this is just a quick presentation, so uh, now we can go to the talk. Dear Karen, I would like to invite you, uh, to, to welcome you to Abralinha ao Vivo. I would like to thank you on behalf of the organizing committee for your kindness of having accepted the invitation. And I'm sure all the followers of, the, of Abralin ao Vivo, especially those interested in syntax of Romance languages, uh, will have a lot to learn from, from you this morning. So please uh, be welcome and uh, the word is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your uh, invitation. Do you see it, my uh, screen? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So, so thanks a lot for the invitation. So, um, my the goal. Of, so the title of my talk is Word Order in French, Spanish, and Italian, and it will be about the interaction between syntax, information structure, and grammaticalization. So um, the goal of this talk is to give you a comparative analysis of word order in French, Spanish, and Italian. And with word order, I mean word order in the clausal domain. So it's about um, word order alternations such as subject, verb, verb, subject, verb, object, subject, word order, and, and uh, so on. So this is interesting because, of course, French, Spanish, and Italian derive from Latin. And they all share a basic neutral SVO word order. These are all head initial languages. However, if you take a look at the other marked word order patterns in these languages, we see that what could look at first sight like a split between uh, Spanish and Italian on the one hand and uh, French on the other hand. So, of course, it is well known that uh, Spanish and Italian behave alike with respect to the verb subject word order. So in Spanish, you can say llega el tren, arrives the train. In Italian, arriva il treno. 
However, in French, arrive le train, arrives the train, is uh, really, really, very hard. This has been correlated with the possibility in Spanish and, Itali Spanish and Italian of having no subjects. So llega to express she or he arrives in Italian arriva also. And this is completely out in French, of course. This has also been linked with the verb morphology of the different uh, Romance languages. So uh, Spanish has been said to have a rich morphology with six phonetic, phonetically realized forms for the person and number uh, alternation. So Diego ligas liga, ligamos ligais ligam. In Italian, exactly the same for the verb arrivare, which we, where we also have six phonetically realized forms. However, in French, there's only three phonetically realized forms. Arrive, which is for the first, second, third uh, person singular, also the, the third person plural, and arrivant, arrivé for the others. So this link, this correlation between VS, the possibility of having VS, free inversion in a language, no subjects and the verb morphology, this is of course what we know as the pro drop or the null subject parameter. So according to the null subject parameter, there's a correlation between VS word order, null subjects and verb morphology. And according to this parameter, then you have a big split between Spanish and Italian on the one hand and French on the other hand. However, this is for romance. If you take a look at typology, the prodrop parameter has been challenged. For instance, by Gilligan already in the 80s, she showed that in a set of 100 languages, which have been balanced and selected with respect to the geographical distribution and the genealogical family, we see that this link between uh, null subject, so prodrop and free inversion, is indeed confirmed by 37 languages. However, it is also rejected in 60 languages. So 60 languages out of her set do not confirm the link between pro drop and free inversion. So this shows that uh, this correlation, which has been established mainly on the basis of Romance languages, is not empirically adequate if you take, if you adapt, adopt a typological point of view. However, even in Romance languages, which where this correlation between null subject and free verb subject uh, word or does seem to hold, I will show that it's not empirically adequate. So in fact, the split, the major split between Spanish and Italian on the one hand and French on the other hand, should, does not hold and should be replaced by a continuum. And could, a continuum which goes, of course, from Latin to Spanish to Italian to French, where Spanish is the less grammaticalized language and French the most grammaticalized language with respect to word order. So with more grammaticalized, I want to say in fact that French is the language which has less freedom, less word order options, less discourse context, so uh, with respect to information structure, and also less text charts. So uh, this is in fact the enterprise I will uh, go through in the following, uh, in, in the meantime, 40 minutes. So in an ideal world, really, if you want to compare different word orders in different languages, you really need or you really want to base this on statistical data. However, this would require extensive corpora, really huge corpora, because some word order patterns in the different languages are not frequent. You also require highly comparable corpora, because word order patterns often, often uh, depend on the texture. So you need a corpora with the same distribution of text genres throughout the corpora, same proportion of text genres. You also need corpora who, who, which are tagged for syntactic function, of course, because these word order patterns are not introduced by any lexical elements. However, unfortunately, at least in French, uh, this type of corpus does not exist. We have some, um, in the other Romance languages, some corpora, but these do not allow such an ideal comparison as the one uh, I sketched above. So in uh, the following uh, talk, I will, as is mainly done in comparative romance syntax, I will uh, use a combination of small corpus research in individual languages, made up examples, um, the results of descriptive works and sometimes experiments. And here I give you two um, recently published books which use on romance syntax, which use the same uh, methodology. So as a background, I already used the terms grammaticalization and information structure. And in what follows, I would like to give you some key notions on these uh, fields and also some key references for those of you who want to dig in these, um, these domains. 
So first of all, uh, with respect to grammaticalization, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a domain in which a lot of research in linguistics has been done. And the most um, frequently cited uh, citation definition of grammaticalization is one uh, of Traug, what I give you there. And it's a process whereby lexical material in highly constrained pragmatic and morphosyntactic context is assigned grammatical function. And once grammatical is assigned increasingly grammatical operator-like function. So uh, to give you an example, in fact, it's about the lexical items, for instance, such as the verb to have, to possess in English, which has a lexical meaning. And in the history of English, it has um, uh, evolved into a marker of perfect tense, which is a grammatical element. So have in have a book which expresses possession now expresses the perfect tense in I have written a book. The same holds for the preposition to, which still has some lexical meaning in I go to New York, so to, in the direction of New York. However, it loses this uh, lexical meaning in, uh, when it's used as an infinitive marker in, as I'm, uh, in, I'm going to sleep, okay? Now, uh, more recently, uh, grammaticalization has also been defined as a gradual drift in all parts of the grammar, so not only with lexical items, but in all parts of the grammar, toward less freedom in use of linguistic expressions at all levels. So whereas grammaticalization has first been applied to lexical items, now it's also applied to constructions and also changes in word order have been accounted for by grammaticalization. So this was a brief introduction in uh, grammaticalization. Let's now turn to the key notions of information structure. Now, information structure is the way in which information is encoded or packaged in the sentence. So if you take a look at these sentences, John wrote a book, that book was written by John, and it's John who wrote that book. Of course, these sentences have the same meaning, essentially, uh, John wrote a book, but they have a different form. And the form is, in fact, the result of the context in which the sentences appear. So John wrote a book is more like is likely to appear in a context where we are speaking about John and we are adding the information that he wrote a book. The book was written by John is uh, more, most likely to appear in a context when somebody where somebody is speaking about a book. And it's John who wrote that book is most likely to appear in a context where, where we are wondering about the author of that book. So who is the author of that book? And we use a sentence to identify the author. So these sentences have the same meaning, a different form and a different context. So, and this adaptation of the form to the context in which a sentence uh, appears, that is the different information structure of these sentences. So in general, information structure is then the way in which information is encoded or packaged in the sentence with respect to the discourse context it occurs in. And the goal is to optimize the transfer of the information in a context. So this reflect, reflects the assumptions the speaker makes about the knowledge of the hero. What does he know? What's important for him? And what's on top of his mind? What's crucial for this for my talk is the fact that information structure is not like not only psychology, but it's really a component of grammar and more specifically of sentence grammar. So it's a determining factor in the formal structuring of sentences. Various conceptual frameworks have been proposed, and I give you some reference uh, on the bottom of this slide. Various theories also about the interaction between information structure and syntax and cognition have been proposed. But in what follows, I just want to give you some key concepts for the analysis of word order. So the key concepts, first of all, um, is the aboutness topic. Aboutness topic is what the sentence is about. And as is frequently done in uh, literature on information structure, we can identify the aboutness topic in what we call the question answer test. So if a sentence like Abralin organized Abralin au vivo, great serial of online lectures, is used in the answer to question like what you know about the Brazilian Linguistics Association or what did Abralin do, then in the answer Abralin is what the sentence is about, it is the aboutness topic. The stage topic is a similar notion. It reflects, it's about the spatial temporal frame of the sentence. So for instance, if we say what happened in 2020, in the answer, we can uh, say in 2020, Abralina Al Vivo was organized. And here in 2020 is the stage topic of the sentence. Some other key concepts of information structure are the focus, which is the most salient highlighted important part of a sentence. So who organized Abralina Al Vivo when we answer 
the Brazilian Linguistics Association organized it. And this sentence, the Brazilian Linguistics Association is new information, it's the focus. Whereas the rest of the sentence is the presupposed part uh, organized. It is the background. So, yeah. so what's also important is that these three basic information structure articulations correspond to three basic communicative functions which are cross-linguistically signaled by different word orders. So the first communicative function, which is to predicate a property relative to an entity, this is realized in language by uh, the about this topic and comment articulation. This is what have been called categorical sentences. So what did Avralin do? And you answer by about this topic Avralin and the comment organize Avralin our vivo. A second basic communicative function in language is to specify an argument in a presupposed or proposition to provide new information which was missing in a context. This is done by the focus background information structure articulation. So in a question like who organized Abralina or Vivo, there is some presupposition. The presupposition is that somebody organized it. And if the answer then is it's the Brazilian Linguistics Association who organized it, here we have a focus background a sentence which is used to specify an argument in a presupposed uh, proposition. The third basic communicative function is to introduce a new reference or an event in the discourse. And uh, for this, we use all focus or thetic sentences. And many, many authors argue that thetic sentences, all focus sentences, necessarily have, have a stage topic, a stage topic which can be overt, as in the first example, what happened in 2020 in that year stage topic and then the rest of the sentence is all new information focus or the uh, stage topic can also already be can also be implicit as in what happens i had a car accident but still i had a car accident is situated with respect to the here and now of the sentence so in what follows and so this was the background in what follows i will give you evidence for the continuum which goes from spanish to italian to Fran french so from the least to the most grammaticalized language and i will do that first by giving you a macro view on word order in spanish italian and french which shows that these languages have increasingly less syntactic freedom and then i will zoom in on uh, some types of word order to show you that uh, there's also a continuum toward less information structure related freedom. So let's start by the macro view, which shows that there's a loss of syntactic freedom in these three Romance languages. So the goal here is to uh, show the distribution of the six possible uh, relative orders of uh, subject, verb, and object throughout the language. So we have six potential uh, orders. And here I will adopt a superficial, a naive point of view, because I will be neglecting interpretation, intonation, underlying syntactic analysis, register, and frequency. I will come back to that later. So as we see here in these examples, Spanish has an SVO word order. Of course, it's a basic word order. It also has a VOS word order. This is what we see in 1B. It also has a OSV word order, as in manzanas Peter come cada dia, apples Peter eats every day. We have in Spanish an SOV word order, mi padre una casa compró, my father a, a house bought. We have the OVS order and the VSO word, word order. So the six possible orders are realized in Spanish. So we can uh, visualize this in this uh, table. So nothing special going on, just like Latin, Spanish has all the potential word orders. Let's take a look at Italian. Italian, of course, also has the SVO word order, which is the basic word order. This is the one you see realized in 2A. It also has a VOS word order, porterà la macchina Mara in 2B, drive the car Mara. We have in Italian the OSV word order, then you see into the, I won't have time to go in all these uh, examples, it's just illustrations, but we also have the SOV word on mio figlio una poesia scritto, the OVS word order, but, and this is a contrast with Spanish, in Italian the VS word order cannot be realized under no circumstances. So it's really a syntactic option that's non existing anymore in Italian. So we can extend our uh, table as in a following, following way with Italian realizing only five of the six word orders as in Spanish. Let's now take a look at French. French has SVO word order. French also has VOS word order. 
it has OSV word order, as you see in C. It's very restricted, but it does exist. So the syntactic option does exist. However, we see in 3D, E, and F that SOV in French is impossible, impossible, no matter what the circumstances or the discourse context is. VSO is also fully out, and OVS, just as in Italian, is also out. So if we compare the, uh, the syntactic options for word order in the three languages, we obtain something like this. Spanish has six options, Italian five, and French only three. So this already shows a continuum going from Spanish to Italian to French. And here we see that Spanish has more freedom and is then in Haspelmatt's uh, definition less grammaticalized, whereas French has less freedom and is more grammaticalized. Now, so in what precedes, I have shown that French has less word order patterns, so has less syntactic freedom. And so at a macro level, French is the most grammaticalized language. However, does this also hold at a micro level? Does this also hold when information structure comes into the picture? So in what follows, we will zoom in on two specific word orders, VOS because it is shared by the three languages and also XVS, it's also shared by the three languages. So the first micro view is on VOS word order in uh, the three languages. At first sight, and quite some uh, attention has been paid to this, uh, if we take a look only at made-up examples in the three languages, these seem to, seem to suggest that VOS in the three languages only shows up in the answer to a question about the subject, so with a narrow focus on the subject. So for, for instance, in Spanish, a sentence like, ayer ganó la lotería Juan, yes, they won the lottery Juan, it shows up in an in a answer to a question like, who won the lottery today? but not in a what happened question. So this shows that Juan, the subject which is underlined in the examples, has narrow focus. And the same holds for Italian, as you see in example five, ha scritto questo libro Dante, is the answer of, uh, to a question about the identity of the one who wrote the book, but not the answer to a, a what happened question. And for French, exactly the same has been said, who ate the cakes? have eaten the cakes Marie, Pierre, and Stephanie. That's OK, but not what happened, have eaten the cakes Marie, Pierre, and Stephanie. So at first sight here, um, the three languages behave alike. However, if um, so they behave alike in having the same discourse interpretation. However, all authors agree that VOS is relatively frequent in Spanish that it's rare in uh, French and Italian, and that more restrictions weigh on realization of that word order, and that in French it only occurs in administrative texts. So uh, we have been doing corpus research on VOS in Spanish, in the Base de Datos Syntacticos, which is tagged for syntactic function, and we show in what follows that it occurs in a wide area of discourse context. And with discourse context, I really mean information structure, okay? So it can have several uh, information structure articulations. First of all, as you see here, it was the beginning uh, of a speech. Siempre me ha producido la mayor admiración rabiosamente ese que se declara de modo tan explícito enfático rabiosamente, rabiosamente español. So I have always been surprised by those who declare themselves furiously Spanish in such an explicit, explicit and implicit way. So we have VOS word order in an old focus context. It's all new. In example eight, in the context, somebody says, you can hear the blows on the wall again, even louder, and then the VOS example, and suddenly breaks through the partition, the handle of a broom, traspasa al tabique al palo de, de una escoba. Here we have, of course, given information, traspasa al tabique, it breaks through the partition. And what is new is the uh, underlying subject. So this is the subject alone is a focus without a contrastive interpretation. We can also have the subject alone, which is in focus with a contrastive interpretation. So in this context, somebody says, it's an interaction. Somebody says, Rafa, don't be silly. How much do you need? And Rafa answers, 25 pesitas. And Chris says, hey, but you already have those from my cousin. And Rafa says, these are others. And she goes on with a VOS sentence. Tiene que dar los suyos Laura, has to give hers Laura. Of course, here Laura is in a contrast with my cousin. So VOS is used in a context where the subject alone is in focus and uh, has a contrastive interpretation. And an even more specific case is the one you see in 10. 
um, it's in the reporting of a football match. So in the football league behind Belido is Juan who played nine full-time matches and so go on and, and go on. And then we all of a sudden have a VOS um, sentence. Together with these three, jugaron los nueve partidos ligueros, Cortés, Mauri, y Lucas. So he will play the nine matches VO of the league, Cortés, Mauri, and Luca. So the verb phrase is already given uh, in the uh, context, but the subject alone, the underlined constituent is new information, and it has an exhaustive interpretation. Nobody more, no other persons, and these will uh, play these uh, nine um, matches. So uh, to give you an overview of Spanish, you see here that Spanish has uh, realizes four discourse options, so four information structure articulations. The first one is an all focus sentence, and then we have three different realizations of the information structure articulation where the subject alone is a, is a focus without contrast, with contrast, and with this exhaustive interpretation. I will come back to later. Now we see for Italian, that this is the same. So 11 is, um, comes from the online corpus La, La, La Repubblica. And here we see a VOS example, prende il microfono, il direttore tecnico Ross Brown, prende verb, il microfono, object, and then il direttore tecnico Ross Brown is a subject. This occurs in all focus context. Similarly, we have examples like 12, where the subject alone is a focus without a contrastive interpretation. In 13, we have examples where the subject alone is a focus with a contrastive interpretation. And also in 14, we have examples where the subject alone is a focus with an exhaustive interpretation. However, it's important to mention that although this seems to be exactly the situation, the same situation as in Spanish, few as in Italian is subject to additional constraints. So people have hard times in, in identifying it. Uh, so there must be some pragmatic constraint raining on, and also some kind of indefiniteness constraint on the subject and or the object. So for instance, 15a is very unnatural if you have both the object and the subject which are definite. However, 15b, where the subject is indefinite, is better. And in 16, we have in fact almost the same. 16a is uh, not natural, it's not felicitous where you have the object and the subject, which are definite, whereas um, 16b is much better when the object is indefinite. So we have the overview here. We see that Italian realizes the same discourse options as in Spanish, but with the proviso that there are more constraints reigning on. The constraints are ill-defined. There's no agreement among other authors, but something is going on. Now, if we take a look at French, so French, um, only realizes one of the four discourse uh, contexts. So only in context four does uh, VOS in French uh, occur and only in formal administrative texts, which also is an indication already, of course, of, its, um, of the fact that it loses its productivity. So in 17, we have something like, we'll receive a card of vote, the students and the academic staff. So here, the post verbal subject, which is underlined, is exhaustive. It enumerates all the reference that will satisfy the predicate. In 18, we have a similar example. Uh, we'll pay a fine all the drivers in breach of the law. So, payeront une amende tous les automobilistes en infraction. Here, the example post verbal subject has an exhaustive interpretation, but it does not do this. It doesn't realize this by uh, enumerating the reference, but by defining the reference. So if we take a look at all of this together, we see that VOS in Spanish is realized in four discourse contexts, in Italian too, but there's some ill-defined constraints weighing on it. In French, it's only, in one it's only realized in one register. So here we see that uh, not only with respect to syntax, but also with respect to information structure, so discourse articulations, Spanish, uh, has more freedom than French, which, ha which has less freedom, and Italian is some, somewhere in between. So this, again, is an uh, argument to state that Spanish is the least uh, grammaticalized and French is the most grammaticalized uh, language. So this was the first microview. So in the first microview, we uh, have taken a look at the VOS, the distribution of the VOS word order in um, the three languages. Let's now take a look at a micro view, at another micro view, at XVS. 
So in the introduction, I uh, have shown you um, this, the, the left table. So in Spanish and Italian, we can have something like llega el tren, arriva el tren, but not arrive le train in French. So in fact, this is a first, uh, the first comparative perspective. We could start from the most, the most permissive languages, Italian and French in this respect, and then take a look at the other language. And then we will, of course, conclude that they lack something. This is what we have done for VO, VOS. However, you could also invert the perspective and you could start from the most restrictive language and then see what it shares with other languages. In fact, it's the same, it boils down to the same, but it's another uh, way of uh, achieving your results. And this is what I will do in the second micro uh, view part. So, um, about, so we start from French here and about XVS uh, word order, First of all, I have to mention that it uh, occurs mostly in the written narrative context and about spoken French, I will talk later. Unfortunately, again, we have this methodological problem that we have no corpora which, which allows statistical analysis. So in what follows are the reports on data stemming from uh, corpus research on XVS and large descriptive works on XVS in French. So uh, the licensing elements X, so X and XVS are part of two classes only. Either they are staged topics, or the second option is that they are foci, WH foci or others. So let's take a look at the first context. So a staged topic is, and I recall here the definition because it's so important, it refers to the time and place at which the event expressed by the sentence takes place. So here we see that you can have inversion in French, so verb, subject to other in French with an explicit staged topic, something like En septembre apparaissent les gros araignées. In September come the fat spiders. And this is, of course, construction you have in many, many languages. You can also have it, but in very restricted contexts with an implicit stage topic. So, El son she rings, arrive une infirmière, arrives a nurse. Okay, so this is the first set of contexts. The second set of contexts is a context where the X that precedes the VS word order is a focus. So it can be a WH element, quand partira ton ami, when we leave your friend. And this is a case in many, many Romans and even other languages uh, where you have verb subject word or inter in, uh, interrogatives. But you also have very restricted cases of focus plus VS in French, as in here. So the context is um, somebody is um, describing the way in which somebody is writing. So he wrote with a kind of distracted concentration, like when you do the on a phone notepad, you listen less and less, and it's a drawing which takes over. And then comes the sentence XVS, ainsi écrivait Alexandre. In this way wrote Alexander. So this sentence doesn't give any new information, but it reasserts, it resumes that it is in this way that Alexander wrote. And this is a very limited instance of film focus of resumptive preposing in French. So in fact, what it does, it forces the narrow focus to fall on polarity and on the scale. And I have another very good example of uh, this influence of the scale in this uh, part of, um, in this uh, articulation. So it's a very recent journal article and the title was, Quelles sont les obligations pour un travailleur exposé au coronavirus? Which obligations does a worker have who was exposed to the coronavirus? And then you have Nombreux sont les travailleurs revenus, so numerous are the workers and so on, so it's XVS. So this sentence also reasserts a previously given content and it puts emphasis on the scale. Now, in French, we have identified two um, different kinds of contexts, stage topic and focus. Now, if we don't have a stage topic and if we don't have a focus, we don't have XVS in French. So for instance, in 23, we have constructed examples with an attitude adverbial and then VS, it's fully out. In 24, we have a sentence adverbial, such as however, cependant in French, this cannot license VS. If we have directional PPs, although they have a lot of common, in common with temp spatial temporal PPs, they do not, um, uh, indicate the time, the time or place at which the event expressed by the sentence takes place. So they indicate the end point of the movement. There are no stage topics. And in French, like you see in 25 and 26, when we have a directional PP in front of the verb, VS is not allowed. So uh, we have two contexts, stage topic plus VS and focus plus VS. 
But of course, this is just only on the basis of um, the distribution. Are there other um, properties who confirm the existence of two different um, configurations in French? Well, yes. If you take a look at stage topic plus Vs, this is not an obligatory uh, type of inversion because it alternates with SV. So you can have en septembre apparaissent les grosses araignées, but you also can have en septembre and then SV, the big spiders appear, les grosses araignées apparaissent. For focus plus Vs, this is out. So quand cet homme arrivera, it's out when this man will arrive and also with the example of Alexandre, and see Alexander Travailler, so Alexander work, it's out. So if you have a pre-post stage topic, VS is not obligatory. If you have a pre-post focus, it is. Something which is typical to French is that uh, when we have a stage topic, we can replace the nominal inversion by a pronominal inversion. And this is not possible when the pre-post element is a focus. So, quand arrivera-t-il is possible in a WH question. And si travaillait-il is also possible, but this is fully out when the prepost element is a stage topic. So this is another part of evidence showing that it's really two independent, independent things going on. The types of verb also which appear in stage topic plus VS, and of course a lot uh, has been written about that, those are only existential presentation of verbs which indicate the appearance, the disappearance, or the typical activity. Whereas with the focus prepost, Vs can be realized with all kinds of verbs. Now, we see here, of course, this recalls the introduction. We have stage topic Vs is really nothing more than the instantiation of, the, of all focus thetic sentences. So this is one of the basic IS uh, information structure articulations I defined at the beginning. And the focus Vs um, sentences are nothing more than an instantiation of the focus background sentence. So in fact, what do we have from a cross-linguistic point of view? We have two licensing contexts of XVS and French, which are nothing more than the expression of two basic information structure articulations. And they have known to have, they, they have do have an impact on the word order cross-linguistically. So we have focus background and stage topic all focus. So about the XVS in French, the licensing context, so the context in which it appears, and the information structure articulations are really two sides of the same coin. So French is not so special after all. If you take a look at romance, and here I won't have time to go uh, into the details, is that what we can see it, is that those two contexts for VS in French are nothing more than subsets of the context of XVS in the other romance languages. With respect to uh, Spanish, this has been shown by Leonetti in 2016. And with respect to Italian, there's also a lot of work on focus preposing and on stage topic VS. And you really see that there the conditions are less strict for Italian than for French. So again, this shows that verb subject word order in French is not radically different from verb subject in Spanish and Italian. It's just more restricted. So again, French is not so special after all. So the consequence of this is that all these data uh, argue in, uh, against the split that I have shown at the beginning of my talk between Italian and Spanish on the other hand, on the one hand, which have prodrop and free inversion, and French on the other hand, which does not have prodrop and free inversion. And this is a welcome conclusion because I already have shown that the prodrop parameter has been challenged cross linguistically. And also in other domains of grammar, it has been shown that French, more and more for syntax, it has been shown that French is more grammaticalized than Italian and Spanish. So everything points to into the direction that there is a continuum going from Spanish over Italian to French, from less to more grammaticalized languages, from more to less freedom in syntax and information structure. However, this prompts an important question. And this important question is the following. So if we want to realize all focus and focus background articulations, and in French we have seen this is done by XVS, or if we want to realize narrow focus on the subject with an exhaustive interpretation, this has been done by VOS. But we have seen that the use of these word order patterns is very limited in French, only a subset of the context in its Spanish and Italian, and only in one specific register. However, at the beginning of the talk, in my introduction to information structure, I have uh, shown you the ideas of Lambrecht, who argues that information structure articulations are in fact the reali realizations of basic communicative functions. 
So all languages want to express them. The question then is how do French speakers express all focus and narrow focus on the subject? Okay, so we have fewer, fewer, fewer words or options, but we have this basic communicative need to express all focus and focus background. So what do French speakers do? Well, this is not a, a question that is typical for French alone, because it's a very important um, question in the whole domain of uh, grammaticalization theory. And here we find the notions of creativity and extravagance, uh, which have already been known by Meyer in the 20s, by Heine, by Haskell, Matt, and many other authors. So this is really what's, what's it all about. If grammaticalization is really continuing from more to less freedom, from more to less options, However, speakers do want to be successful in communication. They do want to innovate. They do want to make themselves um, remarked. So this leads to an opposite, an opposite, sorry, an innovative mechanism, which goes hand in hand with grammaticalization and which consists in being more creative, more extravagant. Now the prediction, this makes a very interesting prediction for French. So if I'm correct in saying that the VS, so the XVS word order, and the VOS uh, words are, are so grammaticalized that, that they can almost no longer be used in spoken French. But speakers want to be creative, so they have to find something else to express uh, these ES articulation. And this is in fact the case. This is the, the, what is happening with clefts in romance. So in French and also in the other romance languages, we have two types of clefts. And clefts, in fact, are biclosal structures. So, c'est Jean qui chante, it's John who is singing, which expresses simple propositional content. So, it's John who is singing is the same as John is singing, but we use, we split, we cleave the sentence in two parts. So, these clefts, c'est clefts, so c'est Jean qui chante, it's John who is singing, are frequent in written and spoken French, and there's a huge amount of literature uh, on these clefts. Now, the prototypical function of these clefts is narrow focus on the subject, okay? So here you see that these clefts are in fact realizing the basic function of the VOS word order. We have a second type of clefts in French, ilia clefts. So these are prototypically used in an all focus context. So what's happening? And you can answer, il y a le facteur qui arrive. There's the mailman who's coming. So, um, here we use a cleft sentence instead of a simple sentence, which is also possible to indicate the all focused nature of the sentence. And this is typical of spoken French. You almost don't see it in the written French. Okay. So from what precedes, we have seen that French has less word order options than Spanish and Italian. We have also seen that clefts are functional variants of the VS and the VOS word order, which is in fact an innovative mechanism. So this in the whole field of grammaticalization makes the following predictions. First of all, French invents clefts earlier than uh, Spanish and Italian, that's the first prediction. The second prediction is that French uses clefts more frequently than Spanish and Italian. And since clefts, if it's true that clefts have been introduced in the language system of French more, more um, earlier than in Spanish and Italian, they should also be more gra grammaticalized themselves in French than in Spanish and Italian. So in what follows, I will just briefly give you some elements which confirm these predictions. And of course, again, I have to say, make the same um, uh, proviso uh, with respect to methodology. Of course, to be really able to show this, we really would like to have big corpora which allow statistic analysis, but that just at the current state of affairs is not uh, possible. First prediction, the appearance of clefts. It's really well known that clefts appear in Old French and then become, become more common in Middle French. It already has been shown by Marcello Mizia. So they appear only later in Spanish and Italian. And until the 20th century, normative grammarians of Spanish and Italian criticized the use of clefts as a French calc. So again, this shows that Spanish um, has less early invented clefts, while French was really one of the first uh, to, invent, to invent, to introduce clefts in the language system. The second prediction was about the frequency of clefts. If French so loses its word or the options more than the other languages, then it needs more innovative mechanism. And it has indeed been shown by uh, many authors that sick clefts uh, are um, more frequent in French than the corresponding clefts in Spanish and Italian. 
So Larivet uh, talks states that clefts in, in French represent 3% of the clauses, while this holds only for a half percentage um, for Italian. Il y a clefts then virtually do not exist in Spanish, which already shows that Spanish is less innovative with this respect. They are very frequent in spoken French, and they are in fact the only option for all focus sentences in French. And Italian Czech clefts, which are the corresponding uh, clefts to Il y a clefts, are also very frequent. So here again, we see evidence for the same continuum. And the third prediction that uh, clefts are more grammaticalized in French than in uh, Spanish and Italian also holds, because if you take a look at the morphosyntax, syntax, we see that in Spanish, the copula agrees in person, has to agree in person with the element that follows the copula in 29. In French, it does not agree in person, so it's already like becoming like a fossilized structure, whereas Italian, as I have been showing throughout my talk, is occupies an intermediate position Sometimes person agreement, sometimes not, and the conditions are unclear. So really this is showing that Italian is in a transition phase, okay? So clefts are syntactic constructions, which are functional variants of all focus and focus background word order patterns, and it's an innovation in word order. So here we see again the same client. Clefts are an innovative mechanism. They appear earlier in French, are used more frequently in French, and clefts themselves are more grammaticalized in French than the other. Okay, so to go to the general conclusion, what have I been doing in the past 45 minutes? First of all, I have presented you a macro view on uh, word order. So the relative word order S, V and O in Spanish, Italian and French. And secondly, I have been zooming in on two word orders shared by the three uh, languages. So VOS and XVS, it was a macro, the micro view. And then in a third smaller part, I have been talking about clefts, which are an innovative mechanism, a functional variant of word order options. And I have shown that all the data point to the same direction, the existence of a continuum going from Spanish on the one hand to French on the other hand, um, across Italian. So French has less word order options, less syntactic freedom, less discourse options, but then also it needed more innovation in cleft, so in general, we can say that with respect to word order, French is more grammaticalized than the other languages. So very much in general, I hope to have convinced you that at least for the phenomena I have been describing, so the variation in word order in French, Spanish and Italian comes from the mapping of syntax and information structure together with the influence of grammaticalization. Thanks a lot, obrigada. Thank you very much, Karin. It was a very nice talk. I think we have a very big picture of, of the variation among these three languages. And uh, we have uh, actually from the audience two questions, I guess. The first one comes from Mariana. Uh, Mariana Terra Teixeira from Porto Alegre. And she asks you uh, the following. Could it be the case, at least in Romance languages, that when we have exhaustivity, not only focus, we must have a different word order? So if I repeat, if I understand the question correctly, so if we have exhaustivity, that we always have a different word order. Well, uh, first of all, in many languages, um, exhaustivity is also indicated by uh, a focus particle. So in French, we have uh, seulement, only. So um, at virtually any place in uh, the sentence, you can use uh, only of so the corresponding uh, phrases in the other Romance languages to indicate exhaustivity. So that's really a lexical uh, way of indicating uh, exhaustivity. But you also have syntactic ways. So this, the, one of the syntactic ways is to use a VOS word order. And in fact, this is the only uh, interpretation VOS can have in French, but it also exists in Spanish and Italian. And the third option is the use of a sec left. So it is cleft or a cleft um, in uh, Italian, and it's less frequent in Spanish, but it does exist. Okay, so we have in fact one lexical option to express exhaustivity by focus particle. We have um, a syntactic option which results from the uh, reordering of constituents in a sentence. And then uh, we have another 
syntactic option which is use of a specific construction, the it is cleft, which, which in many languages has an exhaustivity meaning. And the um, opinions are a bit divergent. Is it really the exhaustivity? Is it inherently um, an inherent part of the meaning of cleft, or is it an implicature? People just don't agree uh, with respect to that. Did I answer your question in a, in a sufficient way? Let's see if she, uh, she, if she comes back to the, to the uh, chat. Um, Karin, I've been following your, your talk and actually most of the argumentation uh, uh, goes in the direction of uh, proposing a continuum between, uh, between uh, Spanish, Italian and French, right? So as far as basically all the argumentation goes uh, for, for, the, uh, for this continuum with respect to word order, right? Only with respect to word order for this, of course, yes. you cannot say that in general, a language is more grammaticalized than another one. You should uh -huh. look at bundles of features and with respect to word order, that's, that's all the evidence seems to point in the same direction, yes. Okay. But then, uh, uh, actually, the uh, your first approximation was from the uh, fr from the point of view of the null subject parameter, right? And, and my question would be, okay, so uh, actually, th there is this this sort of evidence you you've shown that uh, 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 shows that uh, Italian uh, Italian Spanish and French they have different. Uh, uses for word order. But as far as the null subject parameter itself is concerned, that means as far as the availability of, uh, of null subjects, um, when we consider this, can we say actually that we have also this, uh, this continuum, continuum between the three languages? Well, if you only take a look at the three um, factors which are involved in an all subject parameter, which is the richness of the morphology and the free inversion and um, the, the prodrop. Um, of course, inside Romance, Romance, I fully agree that this seems, this shows a split between the languages, French and, uh, sorry, Spanish and Italian on the one hand and uh, French on the other hand. So of course, if you, only take a look at a superficial look at uh, these factors. Of course, you will always arrive at that conclusion. But the thing is that it's perhaps the data, uh, if you zoom in on the data, um, so if you do not no longer adopt this, this like most necessarily superficial typological view, but if you really dig into the factors which are interacting inside one language, then you see that uh, inversion does exist in French. So already this opposition between um, free inversion and no inversion at all, it doesn't, it's, it's not empirically adequate. So this is already one part of the, of the problems inside romance for the pro drop parameter. But of course you cannot neglect the fact that um, French must express the, the subject and uh, Spanish and Italian don't. That's, that's of course something that's, that holds. And, and of course, if speakers frequently encounter that kind of sentences. This might also have an effect on, on the word orders, but I mean that with the prodrop parameter is, has uh, been um, presented as a grammatical option. So, and this is much more fundamental than it is in reality, I think. Mm -hmm. this, this effect of, of developing historically different sorts of, of uh, cleft constructions in French, uh, it, it is more, more or less simultaneous with the change in the uh, uh, null subject parameter, or there is uh, some kind of, of preceding order between the two events? Yes, uh, well, in, in French, we have, uh, well, the, the, the history of French has been studied quite well. And through the history of French, we see, so going from Latin to French, we, so in Latin, you had all word order options, of course, be, because you have the, the, the case uh, system. And when it's, the case system decreases, um, we see that there's like two different trends um, towards uh, modern French is that the sequence VO gets fixated and then the sequence, sequence SV. 
So these two trends together, in fact, go to the direction of SVO, which is the most um, frequent word order pattern, of course, in French, be it in written or in spoken French, as it's still the same. Of course, spoken French goes further. Right? You, don't, you don't have a lot of SVO sentences in French, but there it becomes like more a discourse configurational language in that, in that topics are almost, well, most frequently are left dislocated. There's a massive use of clefts. So um, spoken French is much, is much more grammaticalized than written French in the use of specific uh, syntactic configurations to uh, instantiate the information structure articulation. So the client goes further. You know, here I've been uh, speaking about written French mainly, but if you take a micro um, diachronic view, if you take a look at the evolutions that have been going on between uh, written French and spoken French, it's, it's also a very um, interesting field to, and there you see in fact the same things going on. So yeah, so in history of French, it definitely has been trends going into the direction of the emergence of clefts, I'm always a bit reluctant, even if the trends take place at the same time, I'm a bit reluctant to see like some um, cause consequence uh, effect in it. I think even with statistical data, it's very hard to, it's very hard to pinpoint. You can see, okay, one trend, one phenomenon is happening at that moment and another phenomenon is happening at the same moment. That's of course you can do in diachronic uh, syntax. But I think you, we have to be very careful uh, with concluding from that that one is the, is, is the consequence of another. So I think that's an open question uh, for all the diacs, for all diachronic syntacticians. Yeah. Right. Uh, we have another question from, from the audience, which is uh, from Marcia dos Santos Machado Vieira. And she, she asks you, uh, what's the role of the passive predication on the relation between the alternation with SV and stage topic and focus. The passive alternation here? Yeah, I suppose, yeah, she is, uh, actually the, uh, these are all constructions, all constructions uh, which have some kind of proposal of constituents, right? So you have a stage, uh, your case of, of okay of adverbs, no? like uh, and see, and the passive. Okay, I understand the question. What's the, diff the, the functional difference between the, the three? Well, it's a very good question, in fact. Um, I see. In fact, passive, if you go from an active to a passive uh, sentence, of course, is, is an argument reversal. Huh? The object becomes the subject of the, of the passive uh, sentence, and the uh, subject becomes the um, well uh, prepositional phrase an agentive prepositional phrase and I think um, yes in fact you could consider um, stage topic vs to be the reversal of sv stage topic a special temporal uh, phrase so indeed it, it's really you in fact what you are doing with the word or the stage topic vs is in fact that you indicate that the subject, which is normally, it's really like, I won't say universally, but still in many, many languages, subject is the unmarked topic of the sentence. It's what the sentence is about. And what you do with the uh, stage topic VS word order is that you indicate, in fact, you don't, the, the subject doesn't have a chance of becoming a topic because the stage topic is already there. So this is mainly used in, um, in contexts where the subject is uh, new information in the sen in the discourse context. And of course, this is the same uh, in passive sentences, of course. Eh? If the, the subject, if you want to really highlight that the subject of the active sentence is uh, new information, you are allowed or you can use a passive construction. In fact, yes, it's an, uh, both, both um, types of constructions consist in alternation of the word or the, of course in a passive it's you can call it argument alternation a stage topic is not always an argument of the verb but a lot of authors say that every verb has a has a spatial temporal um, argument so i think from a functional point of view definitely these uh, passive sentences and stage topic vs are the result of the same basic communicative um, the basic communicative function 
of introducing a new event of a definitely discourse. Definitely. The same, they are in fact realization of the same basic uh, communicative function. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Um, actually, you should tell me more or less uh, how many questions you would like to answer or how many. I have all the time. Okay, all right. So let's go. There are another one from, from the audience. I, I will do my, I have another one of myself here. So I, I, I made this one first. Uh, when you were discussing uh, the, uh, the XVS order in, in French, uh, you said that actually this, this word order can be uh, used for two, for two purposes. Uh, one is to, uh, to, to have a stage topic in the, in the exposition, right? Um, so, and the other, the other possibility would be um, that you have in the exposition a focus and the, the rest of the sentence would be uh, the, the presupposed part of the sentence, right? Mm -hmm. So in one case, the exposition is part of the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, just the contrary, on the other case, the, the, Ground is just the rest of the sentence. So I'd like to know if uh, if you think that that uh, despite the fact that the, 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 uh, this word order is used for quite quite the contrary, I mean, co uh, in an opposition as far as information structure is concerned, if they have the same syntax, or you think that they have a different underlying syntax? Oh yes, I do. I do. Um, I didn't go into the the syntactic part of the. Uh, of the of the constructions, but definitely I would say that they have a different different syntax because um, I shown you some slides that, for instance, and in, when you have stage topic vs, you can also have stage topic sv. So there, the vs word order is not obligatory. Whereas in the focus part, well, in, in the other uh, configuration where you have focus vs, there vs is obligatory. You cannot reverse the order of subject and verb. Something that's typical for French is that. Behind the stage topic, you cannot have a pronominal inversion. So you cannot have in September arrive day. En septembre arrive till. No way. That's really fully ungrammatical. It's not even a matter of pragmatic uh, preference. Whereas with a preposed focus, ainsi uh, fait-il. So does he. That's fully OK. So this is also one particularity of, of French that it has pronominal inversion. So not only nominal subjects, but pronominal subjects can occur behind the verb. So I didn't, of course, I didn't go uh, into the syntactic details, but uh, according to me, uh, the, and, and some other authors, I'm definitely not the first to, um, to argue this. I think that focus VS is really reminiscent of V2 word order. So um, whereas stage topic VS is like locative inversion. So there's different syntactic things going on. Um, in a cartographic generative uh, perspective, you would, of course, say that the stage topic and the prepost focus are in a different uh, part of the sentence. Some authors have even said that stage topics can occupy the subject position to uh, satisfy EPP. Um, this is really a question. They are definitely different with respect to their syntax. How to formalize it, I think that's much harder to, to do. Okay, but, but there's a series of different syntactic uh, properties that um, allow us to distinguish uh, uh, stage topic VS and um, focus VS. Yeah, for instance, also stage topic VS occurs in embedded clauses and the focus VS does not occur in embedded clauses. So this is in, 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 in touch with a whole bunch of other uh, work that has been done on main clause phenomena. Yeah. Right. So let me make a question from, from the audience from Ar Aroldo Andrade. The question is, um, are there correlations between word order and types of marked constructions with, with aboutness topic? Are there correlations between word order and types of marked constructions? Yeah, so I, I think that, well, I could be wrong, but marked construction with about this topic, I think the, the, the person who is asking the question might hint at a leftist location, 
So a lift dislocation like in uh, Jean, il fait cela. Jean, he is doing that. Um, which of course are more visible in French because of the non uh, pro drop nature. And um, in any case, so left is, clitic left dislocation does exist also in uh, Spanish and Italian and has been um, investigated by a lot of authors and mainly in, in the generative uh, framework. They have been doing a really good job uh, by describing this. Um, what do I have to say on it is that, again, if we take a look at this mini diachronic point of view, the evolution between written French and spoken, in, in spoken French, like dislocation is omnipresent. Uh, we have had a big project here on the acquisition of left dislocation in French. Children use it really from the first two word utterances. So it's really like something that is really basic in French. And I think, and many, many authors do that, that the uh, topic comment articulation is perhaps more fundamental in language than the focus background articulation. This has, has also been shown in, in, in psycholinguistic um, literature. So it is something different. It is something different, but um, I don't know if I ask, if I answer the question. So there is like, I think that if languages express their information structure articulations more explicitly, like spoken French is doing now, they are becoming more, you could say, discourse configurational because they like make syntax lighter, well, core syntax lighter, and they make more use of the peripheries, like in this location, or of the um, specific constructions as clefts. Yeah, so you have, I think, languages which do more with reordering of constituents. And of course, Latin was a good example of it. And all languages which have uh, an elaborate case system uh, have that. And then you have languages which are in between. And then you have languages which have been called, well, discourse configurations, perhaps a big a bit word, but which mark information structure in a more uh, unambiguous way. In, um, and spoken French is definitely one of them, I think, yeah. But still, there will never be a one, well, at this moment, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, it's syntax and information structure. As you already said, um, it's quite weird. In fact, for linguists, we, we do not want one syntactic configuration to uh, provide two different functions. We, we don't like it, of course. Um, but it's still, for XVS and um, and stage, so for a stage topic VS and focus VS, you could say there's really quite some syntactic evidence that it's different phenomena. So it, there's, they're only superficially the same. Um, but for instance, clefts, uh, so it is clefts, which are the main, let's say the oldest ones, I think. Lehmann has a really interesting uh, article and uh, Andreas Dufter also worked on it. And uh, I only have been able to show you here really like, like a very superficial view on clefts, but and especially in spoken French. So whereas sec clefts have uh, prototypically been used for focus background um, articulation. So who did it? C'est Jean qui l'a fait, okay? Um, so it's John who did it. However, in spoken French or in, uh, and also in narrative context, you very use or um, seclefs are very often used with the topic comment articulation. For instance, you are talking about um, Brazil, and then you say, "C'est là que j'ai rencontré mon mari." It's there where I met my husband. So, what are you doing with the cleft? You are really not providing new information in the, the focused element. So, you are just adding information about Brazil. So, this is really the same. You have like an, an inverse. A, the, a complete reversal of uh, information structure articulations. So these are less frequent, but still they are really uh, progressing in, in spoken French. And I think it's, it's a big challenge. Of course, we, we would like to have a one-to-one -one mapping between syntax and information structure, but it simply isn't, doesn't exist. And I think that in the end, what we do with marked syntactic um, structures as clefts is that we say, attention, something special is going on. This is not the normal way of seeing. So 
Um, and the Iliac left does exactly the same. So I think that if you really go, want to have an integrated view on all types of clefts, you should describe the different information structure articulation. But in the end, I think if you really want to dig further, you might uh, come to the conclusion that they, and that's the bit of a vague conclusion, of course, that they, the fact that you split a sentence in two so that you use a complex syntax, in fact, where, where a simpler variant is, is, is available. So you, you put effort in your sentence. So this, this really means that you want to put emphasis on something. And I think that this is really the core meaning of clefts. What the something is, that could be the focus, that could be the topic. It's, I think we, 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 we go to that direction. And of course, it's, it's a difficult one for everybody who is working on information structure because it's, um, in fact, it shows that information structure is less important than you have always been thinking. And, and there's a brilliant article by uh, Matic and Witchwood uh, in 2013 who showed this for uh, focus. If, if I really, I can, I can really uh, advise everybody who's working on information structure to read it. It shows that focus is really not a linguistic primitive. So it's quite, it's quite uh, convincing. However, he shows that focus can be used as um, a heuristic tool. So in language comparison, it's, it helps you to describe what you see. Of course, we, I think everybody is convinced about that. So you can use it to um, describe the context of, for instance, here where VOS occurs or where clefts occur, are occurring. But according to Matej and Mitch, with, and I'm very sympathetic with ID, you cannot use it as an explanation. However, here again, he only says it for focus and not for topic. So this is one another type set of arguments that the two are really fundamentally distinct. It's it's a, a promising way. It's it's a very a slippery way, I think, to think about the interaction between syntax and information structure. But I think in any case, we have to we have to try to follow it to see where it leads where it's leading us. So. If you want to be scientifically honest, I think we have to take into account the alternative hypothesis that is that we can only use information structure to describe correspondences and, and differences between languages. But in any case, I think everybody is convinced that it has a function, but we have not yet um, been able to uh, to pinpoint really really the the, the importance of it. Yeah. As you were uh, commenting on this, uh, I remember these uh, the. That old paper by Schwarzschild on givenness. Yeah. Actually, uh, in that paper, uh, uh, the new information, which is focus, of course, uh, is derived, right? So it's not a primitive. Mm -hmm. Everything comes from from the definition. Of the primitive of of information structure is is givenness. Is givenness. Eh? So givenness so. has to be has to be uh, has to be grammaticalized because you have pronouns and pronouns are part of the functional structure of language, right? Yeah. Thank you for remembering it's me. A, I know the yeah. paper, but I forgot that, that they said exactly the same thing. Yeah. yeah. It's, and it's, it's quite some psycholinguistic evidence also showing that, that I can't remember the details, but anyone who would like to have them, I could, I could look them up. That topic is, is more fundamental than focus. And uh -huh. I think it is, if you, if you take a look at young children, they really, in French, they want to indicate a topic. Focus is just what follows from it. I think it's 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 more derived. I think I, I fully agree, and that that would also explain the problems we have in defining focus and the different types of uh, an aboutness topic is an aboutness topic and a stage topic of course that's that's some something different. But focus we have contrastive focus, corrective focus, virum focus, restrictive focus. Open focus, closed focus, exhaustive focus. We have, yeah. and, and if you have such a set of mechanisms to account for your data, perhaps you this should be something underlying. I fully agree with that. But still, I think we can use focus as a as a tool, because of course, if you have a lot of, I am, I always mostly work on corpora, and and you need tools to, you need like codes in in your files to. To describe the context, if you are functional, if you are adopting a functional point of view, you need it. But yeah, even yeah, yeah, it's. I think we are heading to that, and I hope to to uh, to be able to help a bit in that discussion in, in my future research. Yes, I will be happy to reflect with everybody who is interesting, who is interested in that. 
That's nice. Uh, Karen, can you take another one? I have all the time today. Okay. Yeah. So, so th th this one comes from Renato Lacerda. And, well, I have to ran render it in English. No, no, he, he made it in, in English. Okay. So he asks, since French has a stricter, stricter word order than Italian and Spanish, does it have to rely more on prosody than Italian and Spanish to express information structure configurations? Well, no, just the opposite. Just the opposite. It's, um, it's an interesting question. Thank you for asking it. It's... Um, um, French has also a strict prosody, well, relatively strict. If um, it's, it's very interesting to see that in French you have the main stress, which is always on the last uh, non, um, la the last uh, syllable that's, that's not like the schwa. Um, for instance, the phenomenon we have in, you, don't, you almost do not have word stress in French. If, if, for instance, in English, if you want to answer a question like who did it, you can say John did it. You know, you put some stress on John. In French, really, it's, it's ugly. He l'a fait, who did it? Jean l'a fait? Really, you have to force yourself. It's really, so you cannot have pre-verbal stress. And that's a big restriction in French. So you cannot have pre-verbal stress, which means that you have no means to prosodically stress the subject. So what do you do? Well, in, in other parts, you, you put the subject in a post-verbal position, but we have seen that, I hope to have convinced you that that has been grammaticalized. So what you do now is you split the sentence in two, c'est Jean qui l'a fait, it's Jean who did it, and then you can again in the first part of that biclosal uh, um, construction, you can let the stress fall on the, sen on the last part of the sentence. So in fact, it's just like a trick um, to be able to put the prosody on the um, on the subject, yeah. Okay. But, so that's a big restriction in spoken French that we cannot put uh, pre-verbal stress. And that's also why uh, focus preposing is so restrictive. Uh, you can have like in in uh, Spanish, la manzana come your Juan. So the apple ate John. But in French, this is really like prosodic pattern that's independently of the syntax you, we, you, don't, you just don't want to have. For independent reasons, I don't know why I'm not a prosodic, but I have a colleague here in a nearby university, I'm Catherine Simon, who is working on that. So there's quite, of, quite some work on, uh, on prosody. So in fact, clefts are, and I didn't, I, couldn't, I didn't have the time to touch upon this, clefts have been invented, so introduced in French to compensate uh, more or less for the, the grammaticalized word order, but most probably also, of course we cannot do diachronic prosody, but most probably also to compensate for the loss of pre-verbal stress. It would, it would make sense, but of course we will never be able to test it. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, Karin, another one. Uh, your argument in, in favor of the, uh, the continuum between uh, Spanish, Italian, and French uh, is based on, on the idea that uh, um, the expression of, um, of information, uh, information structural patterns by means of the order VOS mm -hmm. are, are, are the same in Spanish and Italian, although in Italian you would have uh, additional restrictions, right? So like something to do with indefiniteness, okay? But uh, basically as far as information structure is concerned, according to you, uh, the two languages can express uh, yeah. uh, all the same possibilities, right? Yes, of course, grammaticalization, you could, if it's coming to syntax, you can see that in a binary option, is it still available, yes or no? But also you could take a look at the productivity. Is it uh -huh. becoming less frequent? And as Italian is in like this transition phase, I understand your question. It's, uh -huh. it's um, perhaps we didn't, we, we, we could not do systematic uh, corpus research on VOS and Italian, but. Okay. Um, My question would be if there is any other um, independent evidence for, uh, for, for, for saying that Italian is in some sense, more grammaticalized than, than Spanish. 
Yes, there is an, an amorphous syntax. And um, I, I've shown some at the beginning in the introduction to grammaticalization in the Big Handbook of Grammaticalization is a, an article by uh, Beatrice Lamirois and de Mulder, which, is in, which are, um, which, who were professors here at the KU Leuven and Antwerp. And uh, they give a lot of evidence that um, Italian always, well, mostly occupies an intermediate position between Spanish and, uh, and French. And this is mostly about morphosyntax because grammaticalization has mostly been applied to morphosyntax. And I, to be honest, I cannot, uh, so much. it's about determiners, it's about the evolution of demonstrative pronouns. There's really, really quite some evidence uh, for this decline, this continuum in other fields of grammar besides, uh, besides uh, word order, definitely. definitely. Yeah, I suppose uh, it holds for auxiliary. Auxiliary, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's really in, in the domain of morphosyntax that you that you see it. Um, perhaps also in the verb morphology, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's really a big uh, verb morphology, auxiliaries, the, everything that stands aspect and roots, yeah. So I, I refer you to that uh, very interesting article in the handbook on uh, grammaticalization, yes. All right. I think this is the last question, which is uh, about the clefts. So basically, uh, uh, towards the end of your talk, you're using the clefts in, uh, in uh, French to say actually that uh, clefts emerged and, and they took over several, uh, let's say, functions which used to be expressed by, by means of word order variation in French. Uh, as as uh, grammatical restrictions started uh, imposing uh, just a few word orders in French, right? So as, as uh, word order is freezing in French, then you develop new ways of expressing information structure, structural oppositions, right? Um, so this would be, this would give, give you the idea that, you know, uh, cleft sentences are expanding their functions around the, uh, the language. They are occupying new fields in expressing information structural oppositions, right? Yeah. At the same time, what you have, I, I think, what you have in, in French, which is a bit different, and perhaps this is a consequence, the fact that, first of all, French uh, has more than one uh, cleft structure, right? Mm -hmm. And I think and Italian... And there's the ones I have uh, mentioned. You have se clefts, ya clefts, and you have also voici clefts, j'ai clefts. So there's quite a, a bunch of cleft constructions, yes. Yeah, you have many, many cleft constructions. And then, of course, each uh, cleft construction, because of its um, morphosynthetic shape, um, it acquires, let's, let's say, a, a more natural function, right? But I would say that if you, if you look uh, carefully at each sort of construction, uh, th this construction is molded by means of its uh, morphosynthetic means to, towards that function, right? Yes, yes. And of course, one of the reasons why uh, you might have a different distribution uh, of clefts in, uh, in French and Spanish Italian is because of the morphosynthetic uh, shape of clefts, right? Um, have you thought about that? Have you uh, digged uh, in this kind of analysis or yeah. facts? Well, the, the main difference is between um, I think in the Ilya clefts. So Ilya is the translation of there is, and it's also used as an existential marker. And so if you translate it into Spanish, you would have I, so there is, and in, uh, in Italian you have che. So in Italian you use the verb essere, whereas it's um, to have plus one element which indicates spatiotemporal um, meaning in okay. French and, and in Spanish. So this, you would expect this to have a difference, but still French stays on the opposite side with respect to this type of cleft than Spanish. In Spanish, we, we did corpus research and we didn't find any real cleft construction with I in Spanish, and it's also not mentioned in grammars. Perhaps it's, it's spoken Spanish, but we did not find any mention of it. Whereas Czech clefts are in Italian 
are a really frequent and spoken Italian, so in the neo-standard Italian, not in, not in the written, but in the neo-standard. And it, in French, they are really very frequent in, um, in, in, in spoken French, so not in written French. So you see, at least in this domain, that um, the morphosyntax of the construction would be the same in French and Spanish, but it's, it's just not existing in Spanish, it, perhaps for other reasons, I don't know. I don't know. Um, what what could be going on there? Why why do such clefts not exist in Spanish? I don't know. And and of course, but, yeah. But the the system of of clitics in Spanish is, is poorer. Yeah. Poorer than the system of clitics in Italian and French. That Italian, yeah. Isn't so. mm -hmm. oh, there is an, another question here, so, but I think this will be the last one then. Uh, it comes from Amalia Canes. Thank you. So she asks you, what's your view on labor distribution between focus and aboutness topics concerning attentional states? Clefts can be used to mark where attention go. Both topic and focus can serve both functions. Yeah, I understand the question. I understand that. And I think this can be linked with what we have been talking about if, if, and there's a very interesting article about that from Lehmann in, in the 90s, I think, Christian Lehmann, who worked a lot of on grammaticalization. And he has shown that in this clefts in English, there's a leveling out of information structure. So it clefts in English and also in, the, in as in French, first served the purpose of like, putting the focus on the, the in element introduced by the cleft, but now this is like leveling out, so it's also grammaticalizing. So, and as we have been discussing about one syntactic uh, pattern, so clefts, which mostly is used to have a focused background partition, but which can more and more render a topic comment um, articulation. And I think if I understand the question correctly, is that the underlying function communicative function could be highlighting. And then you could highlight what the sentence is about, or you could highlight the new information. I, in fact, I fully agree with that. But from a methodological point of view, I think it's just hard to, to, to confirm or to reject it. I, I don't see an alternative hypothesis, in fact. I think it's basically correct but perhaps we might never be able to, to, um, to prove it. Because highlighting, and, I've, and I, I know the first attempts of defining information structure notions have been done in, in, in terms of highlighting. And I think it is really still a basic, fundamentally correct intuition, yes. So you could <laughs> highlight new information, but you could highlight old information. And by using a complex sentence structure, so by cutting a sentence in two, where you don't need to, you can be lazy and just have a normal sentence with, with much less structure, but you still, you do the effort to cut the sentence in two, what you do is say, hey, attention, something special is going on here. It's perhaps not more than that, yes, perhaps. I think if we take a Lambrecht theory of information structure, Actually, we could say that folks and topic have a similar role as far as attentional states are concerned, but the, what makes the difference is the pragmatic function, right? So focus has to do with assertion and, and the topic has to do with, uh, with the presupposition, right? With the yeah. So actually, then it's not about the difference from, uh, between the two functions is not with respect to or is not particularly with respect to attentional state, but with respect to the pra pragmatic purpose of, of the... Yes. Yeah. And then you can, of course, highlight one pragmatic purpose or another one. I think this, mm -hmm. this in fact, is a nice formula. Thank you. I've never thought about that in this way, but this is a nice formulation of the, of the ID. And it's make, it makes a lot of sense, I think, to see it like that way, yeah. So you use, in fact, syntax, here or in other languages, intonation to 
to highlight one or another pragmatic function. I think that would be a nice conclusion. And in other languages, you do it in a morphological way because in, in I think it's Japanese where you have the one, the gada distinction. I think it's the uh, ga that's used to indicate like something like focus and the wa for a balanced topic could, could be different, but there you have different morphological means. So, but in any case, you use one element of language to highlight a pragmatic function. I think that's really, I think we can all agree on that. That would be a nice, that's, so this shows the interaction between syntax and then information structure and then pragmatics in a more broad uh, definition. Yeah. Okay, Karen, thank you very much. We don't thank have you. it. So. Thanks everybody for your attention and, and the really interesting questions. All right. Thank you very much. So with, with this uh, last uh, answer from Professor Laus, 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 I think we can end our session this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank Karen. you. It was a great pleasure. I would like. Uh, I would also like to thank all the audience we had. I cannot close this without emphasizing the importance that you people, out, uh, you people out there, who are interested in linguistics, all join Abradin. That would help a lot to keep linguistic research in Brazil strong as it has been for decades. And, uh, I'd like to ask everybody to remain engaged in Abradin ao vivo and to inviting friends and colleagues to join in as well. And, uh, Karen, if you want to have uh, some final words, please. Well, uh, thanks all of you in Brazil and, and everywhere else. And uh, if uh, I really enjoyed giving this talk and like putting all the elements of my previous research together. And if uh, you would have questions or if you would want to collaborate or something or to investigate more Brazilian Portuguese, because it's really interesting. Brazilian Portuguese is interesting with respect to this. Uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, my email is, is in the general information. So I will be happy to help or collaborate or interact or discuss. Thanks a lot for all your attention.